Hello everyone, and today we're going to be talking about rotations and transformations. So, to start off, what is a rotation? Previously, we have focused on ideas of XYZ position offset, but there's an additional component of pose called orientation. The orientation can be thought of as the direction the robot is pointing. The best way to think about this is it is an angle offset from some fixed frame. Often orientation is the most complicated part of a coordinate system. To this day, Matt and I still struggle with properly handling it. The first gender rotation is roll, a rotation around the x-axis denoted by phi. The second rotation is pitch, a rotation around the y-axis denoted by theta. And the third rotation is yaw, a rotation around the z-axis denoted by psi. Typically, angles are defined in the range of negative pi to pi and are in radians. In this course, we will adopt the notation of phi theta psi, but please note that rotations do not have any hard set conventions. There's a very good chance you'll run into notation that you are not familiar with at some point. So, as per usual, make sure to check the notation when you obtain a new source. Note, you will often see theta denote yaw if we were talking about a system with a single rotational degree of freedom. That means two of our three rotations are fixed and cannot change. An example of this is the Roomba. You only need the x, y position and yaw to navigate. The robots you'll be using in this course are similar, so this is the primary system you'll be dealing with. So the first representation of orientation we're going to talk about is Euler angles. So this is what we've been talking about previously. So Euler angles are defined based on some rotation around your fixed axis. So this is where we get our phi theta psi from. So there are two important properties of Euler angles. The first is that the order matters. If I do a roll and then a pitch, that's different than doing a pitch and then a roll. The second is, since you can apply these in different orders, there's a lot of different orderings that exist in the world, and different fields have different conventions. So you can never assume that you have a specific ordering of Euler angles unless it's explicitly defined. This is one of the reasons a lot of people avoid them. A large issue with Euler angles is this thing called the singularity or gimbal lock. And essentially what that means is in certain critical points, you have ambiguity in what is rotating. So as we can see here, a great example of that. So we take our plane and we pitch it up 90 degrees. So when that happens, our blue and green axes are lined, which is, uh, stands for our roll and our yaw. So by changing a roll, I can compensate that with a change in yaw and end up at the same orientation. So it's essentially unclear which one is changing and which one is not changing. So there are multiple solutions to this orientation. So something that avoids this is another representation of orientation, and this is called the rotation matrix. So the rotation matrix um, comes from a special family of matrices called SO3, which stands for Special Orthogonal Group. And these have two really important properties that are important for rotations. The first is that it preserves the length of any vector it is multiplied by. And this means that I can take an infinite number of rotation matrices and multiply them together and multiply it by a vector. And all I've done is apply a rotation. It doesn't change the length of the vector. The second is that the matrix inversion is also the transpose. So our transpose is equal to our inverse. And this allows our math to be a lot simpler. So here we have some z prime, which is a rotated point. We're going to take some vector z and rotate it by r to give ourselves z prime. And after we do that, we can just apply the transpose and rotate the rotated point back to the original point z. So there are three different rotation matrices that are defined. The first rotation matrix is around the x-axis. So you get something that looks like that at the top. Um, the second is around the y-axis, so you get the second one. And the third is around the z-axis, so you get the third. So what you would typically tend to do if you were to represent an Euler angle is take your Euler angles and then apply into each one of these matrices on whatever axis you are talking about, and then multiply all the matrices together. So we can combine multiple rotation matrices, and that is a closed operation. And what I mean by that is that a rotation matrix time a rotation matrix is another rotation matrix. There's no way to multiply two rotation matrices together and get something that is not a rotation matrix. So here what we can see is we can pre-multiply the rotation matrices. So we have some z prime is equal to some rotation matrix Ra times z, uh, and then z double prime is that rotated vector times Rb. We can also write that as Rb times Ra times z. That's the same value, or we can, since matrix multiplication is associative, we can combine these two together into one matrix and then multiply through. So this is really helpful when you're trying to save time when you're doing um, a lot of rotations or a singular rotation in a robotic system. You pre-compute this matrix once and you've simplified your problem to a single matrix multiplication instead of multiple. So the third representation of rotation is quaternion. 
So quaternions are defined based on four values, and there's not really a good intuition about what those four values represent in the real world. I still to this day cannot look at a quaternion and tell you what the orientation should be. So there's a lot of useful properties though. So we have things like addition is associative and commutative and done element wise. So this is very computationally efficient. Uh, we have multiplication and addition is a closed operation. So again, you can take a quaternion, multiply it by a quaternion and get out a quaternion. And multiplication applies a rotation and it's associative but not commutative. This is just like the matrix multiplication case. And you can actually represent the same expressiveness of rotation with a quaternion that you can with a ro um, rotation matrix. So there's also the unit quaternion, which is defined here. So you have Q inverse Q is equal to one, zero, zero, zero. So to summarize, uh, we've talked about with the rotations. We have Euler angles, which are very intuitive. It was very easy for me to explain to you what roll, pitch, and yaw meant in the 3D space. Um, but it has this singularity issue, so we can't find a way around that. And is also discontinuous. Handling the values going from pi to negative pi instantaneously uh, is mathematically complicated. <laughs> So we also have quaternions. So quaternions are, they don't have a singularity. Their math is very fast because they're a low dimensionality representation, but they're not intuitive. Uh, no one can look at a quaternion and tell you what the orientation is that's a normal person. Um, and then rotation matrices don't have the singularity as well. The math is pretty easy. It was very easy for me to explain it to you, um, but they're very verbose. It's using nine values instead of four. So Ross will standardize on using quaternions instead of any other representation for its message. So often when you're looking at a Ross system, you will take some quaternion, and if you wanna do math on it, I would recommend converting it to a rotation matrix if you are having issues with it. Otherwise, you can just apply uh, rotations using quaternions um, directly using some libraries that do the math for you. So now that we covered what rotations are, we're going to arrive at a new problem. So let's say we have a robot in one position, and we want to transform it into a robot in another position. So this is not going to be made up of just a rotation. You're also likely going to have a translation. So we would like to do this in a single step. Um, that would make our math easier and a lot harder to mess up. So the matrix representation to do a transformation uh, is a thing we call the transformation matrix. So there's a 2D version, there's a 3D version. Uh, first, we're going to focus on the 2D version. We'll use a slightly different um, rotation matrix than we're used to. The matrix representation of this transformation can be shown here. So there's a 2D representation where we fixed the Z position and we can ignore it. And by doing so, we reduce the dimensionality of our rotation matrix. So we get this smaller matrix um, here, and this is our rotation. Then we can also combine this with some translation, which we represent by PX and PY. So now that we have our transformation matrix, we're going to try to transform some point. So we usually represent our points as x, y, which is a vector of the x position and the y position. So you'll quickly realize that we have a three by three matrix and we're trying to multiply that by a two by one vector. And this doesn't work because these two dimensionalities do not match. They have to match. So we define something called a homogeneous coordinate where we add an additional one to our vector. So we end up with something that represents this. So now we have a three by one vector and we can do this multiplication. So as an example, we will take a point P, uh, which is represented by the vector two, three, so two in the X and three in the Y, and we're going to rotate it by pi over two. So we take our rotation matrix, R3, this is the one that's defined around the Z axis, because since we are on a 2D plane, we're rotating around the Z. Uh, so that is the rotation matrix we have there, and we have no translation in this rotation example. So these two are left as zero. So if we simplify that out, we get that value. And then we take our point P, we augment it with our one, and we multiply the two together. We end up with three, negative two, one. If you plotted these two points, you would see a 90 degree rotation between them. So now we have the 3D transformation matrix, which looks very similar to the 2D transformation matrix. But now we have to come back to our three by three rotation matrix because we are in three dimensions. So you can see our three by three rotation matrix in the four by four matrix there. Then we also have a offset based on our translation, which is represented by this vector. And then we also have this row of zeros and a one. So what we can see here on the left is a thing called block notation. And the reason that we have a thing called block notation is because often we're writing very large matrices and it's easier to write them as smaller components rather than the whole thing written out. So 
The correspondence between these two are, you can see this rotation matrix R, which I have written out as a three by three, can be written just as this simple R. And then this translation vector, we can represent as T, and then this zero vector, we can just write as zero transpose. And this represents the correspondence between these two matrices. They represent the exact same values. Uh, one's just a shorthand notation for the other. So that was the introduction to rotations and transformation matrices. And this will be a key part of this week's exercise.